the last of the Colorado-class battleships, Weavy dodged a major bullet right out of the starting gate, with four ships being built. The Washington Naval Treaty eventually called for at least one of them to be scrapped. Colorado and Maryland were already too far along, but BB-47 and 48, Washington and West Virginia, were in similar conditions, with Washington having been started and launched before West Virginia. However, a committee, including Admiral McElroy, decided, for somewhat opaque reasons, to keep West Virginia over the slightly more complete Washington. The only explanation that I can think of is that West Virginia may well have ended up completing faster, since Washington had been started ten months earlier, but only launched two months earlier, losing eight months' ground compared to her sister ship. In any case, West Virginia would commission into the fleet in December 1923, armed with eight 16-inch guns in four twin turrets arranged in super-firing pairs fore and aft. There is some disagreement as to whether her initial secondary battery consisted of 14 or 16 5-inch 51 caliber guns, but it is agreed that the initial anti-aircraft battery consisted of four 3-inch guns along with a pair of torpedo tubes to round out the armament. Just under 29,000 shaft horsepower drove four screws through a turboelectric drive, to a relatively pedestrian top speed of 21 knots. Her main armour belt was generally the relatively standard 13.5 inches found on standard type battleships, and she featured a new design on cage lattice masts, a stronger but heavier version that would last throughout the interwar period. After her trial cruise, the ship's first excitement would occur in June 1924, when she was happily sailing along the Lynn Haven Channel. Happily, that is, until the crew found the engine room and steering telegraph systems weren't working, and thus the ship was out of control. Yelling into the backup voice tube, the captain tried to use the engines to steer the ship, but to no avail, and she joined the American battleships which ran aground in their own waters club. Luckily, getting her free and repaired was relatively uncomplicated, and she would become the flagship of the Navy in 1924, winning a series of gunnery and efficiency awards over the next few years. She would also participate in the regular fleet exercises, or fleet problems, where the United States Navy would split into two teams and conduct full-scale war games to test various theories about attack and defence. She would accidentally open fire on the carrier Saratoga at one point, mistaking her for her sister ship. A lot of American battle and developmental doctrine would arise out of these fleet problems, including guidance for the dispersal instead of concentration of carriers, and a plan, fortunately not realised, to build many smaller carriers instead of few large ones. Viewers who have more recently served in the United States Navy, or who have otherwise heard of the Sea Control Ship project, may recognise this line of thinking. Towards the end of the 1920s, she would swap her 3-inch anti-aircraft guns for the much superior 5-inch 25 calibre weapon, add catapults for aircraft and some 50 calibre machine guns for good measure. At some point in the period, her secondary battery also seems to have been reduced to 12 guns. Later on, she would also be one of just over a dozen ships to receive the CXAM-1 radar set and be deployed to the Pacific, basing out of Pearl Harbor in 1939 and 1940 as a deterrent to Japanese aggression. As a deterrent, this effort was something of a failure, as on December the 7th, 1941, the far-from-deterred Japanese appeared above Pearl Harbor in a mass surprise attack. West Virginia was moored on the outer line of Battleship Row alongside the Tennessee and duly suffered for it, being hit by two bombs adapted from 16-inch shells and no less than seven airdropped torpedoes. Both bombs and one torpedo failed to explode, but the second bomb went through the roof of the upper rear turret and destroyed one of the 16-inch guns anyway. Of the torpedoes, one hit the rudder, three hit below the armour, one hit on the armour, and the remaining two appear to have entered the holes made by the first strikes as the ship listed to port, exploding inside the ship against the armoured deck. To add insult to injury, a combination of aircraft fuel from a float plane that had been on the turret plus oil leaking from the ship, and the Arizona nearby, would catch fire and slowly envelop the ship, burning for over a day. Before that hellstorm reached them, though, the ship's crew did their best to save what they could, 
Counter-flooding and closing the remaining watertight doors prevented the ship from capsizing, along with valiant efforts to fight the fires assisted by the crew of the Tennessee, who passed over hoses and lent the power of the ship's pumps and other firefighting equipment, until, with the captain dying of wounds and the first officer having abandoned ship, the second officer, Lieutenant Commander John S. Harper, reluctantly ordered the crew to abandon ship at 1400, as it settled to the bottom amidst an increasing curtain of flame. Thanks in large part to the crew's efforts, the ship would settle upright and was one of the most salvageable of the ships that had been sunk. The hull was patched, pumped out, and refloated again on the 17th of May 1942 before being taken into a dry dock. This initial salvage work was grim, having to recover 66 bodies, including three men who'd found themselves trapped below decks and locked themselves in a storeroom, surviving on the room's rations and fresh water for over two weeks, before running out of either supplies or air. A year later, the ship would sail for the mainland for a complete rebuild. This was, as the term suggests, quite extensive. The cage masts went, as did the two funnels, the anti-aircraft battery, the secondary battery, the entire casement superstructure, and more. In its place came a single funnel, eight twin 5-inch 38 caliber dual-purpose turrets, 40 40 mm Bofors guns, and 50 20 mm Orlicans, along with simplified fire control tops. Finally, along with Tennessee and California, the beam was widened to 114 feet, wider than the Panama Canal and effectively locking these ships into the Pacific, partly to offset some of the increased weight, and partly to provide a more comprehensive anti-torpedo defence since the First World War era system had rather obviously failed the tests of war. As a side effect, this made the West Virginia resemble the two Tennessee class more than her sister USS Maryland, with the exception of the twin 5-inch turrets. As an almost new battleship, she would arrive in the Pacific operational area at the end of 1944, ironically alongside several of the Iowa class, in the middle of the invasion of the Philippines, avoiding a mine dislodged by California on practically her first day on the job, before getting stuck into shore bombardment. But in late October, she damaged a number of her screws by going aground, limiting her speed to between 16 and 18 knots, depending on how urgent the situation was. Her already slow speed had ruled her out of carrier escort duty, and as a result, when the most modern part of the American invasion force tore off north after the decoy force, leaving Taffy 3 to tangle with Yamato and friends, West Virginia found herself guarding the southern flank of the landings, with Admiral Nishimura's force approaching led by the battleship Yamashiro. Leading a line consisting of Maryland, Mississippi, Tennessee, California and Pennsylvania, the West Virginia detected the incoming Japanese ships with its advanced radar suite and opened fire early in the morning, scoring a hit with her first salvo and following it up with over a dozen more. Having helped sink the Yamashiro, she headed off to get her screws fixed. Although her shore bombardment role continued, her anti-aircraft battery came more and more in demand as kamikaze attacks started raining down as 1944 turned into 1945. Wrapping up operations in the Philippines, she headed for Iwo Jima in February 1945, her shore bombardment having marked effect, including a hit on an ammo dump that caught fire and would proceed to blow itself up over the next two hours in a series of spectacular explosions. Replenishing her ammunition, the next stop was Okinawa, where she was hit by a kamikaze, before being deployed as part of the massive backstop line in case the carrier aircraft failed to stop the incoming Yamato. After further gunfire support missions, she received minor repairs and was back off the coast of Okinawa when word of the surrender reached the ship and she would be present in Tokyo Bay for the formal signing. She would then make several runs as part of Operation Magic Carpet before being placed into reserve in January 1946. She would stay there until 1959, when she would be sold for scrapping. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.